Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and all the ships at sea. This is the Writer's Journey brought to you courtesy of Keystroke Medium. And today we have a special treat for you. We have not one, not two, but three Keystroke Medium hosts. I am Chuck Manley, Papa Chuck to all my friends, here with Lauren Moore, Kayleen Williams, the usual hosts of this show. But I have come in and I have taken over. Yes. How are you ladies doing today? Doing so great. Doing fantastic. Especially now that you're. We're yeah, we get allergies, and we're really glad you're here because we because <laughs> you don't want to talk. We well, there's that. There's that. Way to tell all our secrets to the internet. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they could figure it out. But we were confessing before the show. It's been a while since we've written, and one of the things we feel has been holding us up is we're just kind of stuck with our process and coming up with a really good plot that we we're enjoying. Well, that's actually very apropos to the moment because that's what we're going to be talking about today over the years i have kind of developed a i don't even know that i'd call it a system it's just a habit that i kind of fell into whenever i'm sitting down to work on something new so it's about 10 or 11 steps to it i'm going to walk you guys through it and we're going to come up with something straight off the cuff we're not even we have had no off-camera discussions about this except for the general format and the fact that i was going to step in and kind of talk. And uh, so, you know, all you guys out there in uh, StreamYard land, just uh, take notes if you want. Now, a couple of caveats. Uh, one, I am in no way asserting that this is the one true method or any of that nonsense. The only one true method when it comes to writing is you have to sit down and freaking write. Mm. Beyond that, there really aren't any rules. This is just what I've developed over the years of doing this. And it's what works for me cherry pick through it. If something sounds good to you, use it. If you think it's utter crap, feel free to keep that to yourself. <laughs> um, you know, but please don't think we're trying to tell everybody, this is the way you have to do it. Cause I do not, uh, I do. Yes. The backdrop. I'm, I was wondering how long it would take someone to say something. <laughs> okay. So just real quick, I'm renovating my office and I like the color green. And I discovered that I painted my office the exact shade of green that I would need to use it as a backdrop, like a so green cool. screen. So I've just been playing around with this. I was almost late with the show because I discovered that and, and I was having fun with it. So anyway, that's that's the story behind the backdrop. Uh, yes, I am here to give everyone a list of chores you can't refuse. You're like my children now. Deal with it. <laughs> Teach okay. us, Bubba Chuck. <laughs> so uh, you guys said you hadn't really been writing much lately. What have you been up to, Lauren? Give us Editing. an update. Editing. Editing. I've got a manuscript that's almost 200,000 words long. It's a lit RPG Jesus. set in like ancient Greece with like all kinds of mythology coming in. So very Ooh, creative. Lots cool. of fun. But it's, you know, I'm definitely in the middle of it and um, shredding, sh taking out words, switching out like whole phrases with a single word if I can if I can do it. And it's it's been interesting like to get my claws in there and just really go at it. So. All right, cool. That sounds like a doorstopper, though, man. That's yes. is it, isn't lit RPG typically a little shorter, like traditionally. No. I, not that you can have because well, it hadn't been around that long, but are they lit. usually really? I've never read any, so I don't know. I yeah, this is about twice as long as any lit RPG or longer any lit RPG that I've I've read before. But it did really well on Royal Road, and now Athon oh. Books is taking it. Well, fantastic! And putting it in my hands first, so here so, we go. Uh, well, you know, you got it. You go with the best. That's right. How about you, Kayleen? What you been up to, girl? Uh, same thing: surviving, editing, more editing, more surviving. But editing. <laughs> <laughs> all the editing. All I've also got I've got a couple RPGs, RB, RPGs, lit RPGs um, on my plate. Plus, uh, are you guys finding RPGs? that lit RPG is kind of the thing that's that everybody's doing right now? Are you getting a lot of that across your desks, or we are? We're working. Well, with that's what Athon's giving me. So that's oh, okay. What I'm taking. <laughs> yes, Cause... but in in like my other worlds, there's still a whole lot of military sci-fi. I've I'm still getting a lot of urban fantasy. So all it's it's not taking over, but it's definitely people are finding I think the groove of it and the fun in it and its place. So a lot more is coming out. I've kind of been meaning to give it a try because you know I'm a writer and a try. gamer. So I am an old I, gamer too, and yeah, it's, so it's kind of like. But I just I sort of like my numbers in my game and my <laughs> my fiction in my fiction. You know, I, I I have a hard time picturing 
merging the two. But hey, you know, I might check it out, find a good one to read and, and see what it's all about. Okay, y'all ready to get started on this? Yeah. Yes. All right. Thing. So uh, I always start off by deciding what genre and subgenre I want to write in. So I'm going to pitch that to y'all. Y'all pick one. Now, here's the thing, though. I'm going to ask that you not do romance because I never write romance. I don't write romance either. So no and worries. lit RPG just because I, I don't really get it and I need to do it. But beyond that, feel free. What, what you know, we can start with, say, thriller and then supernatural thriller or mystery or whatever. Just give me a, a genre and a subgenre. And if you're in chat, feel free to chime and in. Yes, please. Have absolutely. Any ideas, things like that. We will bring you into the conversation. I and like Luke's idea. He was thinking along my pathways too. He says space opera okay. from me. And I agree, space opera. I love it because there's so many possibilities. But so sci-fi, space opera. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say yes to that only because um I mean I was gonna say thriller, but that's me being selfish because I'm looking into mashing two genres. Well, once once we get through all this, hopefully you can be just take it back and apply it to thriller. Uh, actually, the last time I taught this, I, I've taught this class to local folks, and um, and that's actually the typical example I use is thriller. But this is more of a sci-fi community, so let's go with space opera. Ooh, but I don't know. Bard of today is now saying cyberpunk, and then Corey Gilliam smashing Ooh. an Earl well, urban fantasy. That's that's my wheelhouse. But what, I'm again, I'm letting you two ladies decide. Y'all talk it out amongst yourselves. What do you think? That's what I'm saying. Like an, an urban, an urban steampunk. I'm, I don't know. I like yeah, steam, steampunk is one I haven't ever really messed with either. But I, you know, I could work with that. Sure. Okay. So what do y'all want to do? I don't know. It could be a space opera urban. Steampunk. <laughs> Probably not? need to Sorry, narrow that focus just a little bit. Okay. I'll let Lauren decide then because I'm going crazy. <laughs> oh um, well, if we did if we did urban fantasy, we could stay in our world or we could go like portal world into somewhere else right. too, like into a cyberpunk world. So okay, let me simplify it for you. Yeah. Do we want to do something real world, like a thriller, a mystery, that kind of thing? Do we want to do something sci-fi like, or do we want to do something fantasy based of those three? That's hard because those are all my interests. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. But, if, but, but look at it from the, now, here's the thing. Look at it from the perspective of I'm going to sit down and write this book. So right. what of those three would you want to work in? I always lean more towards fantasy myself or, or thrillers fantasy. with a supernatural edge. That's just, just where my that. head goes. Let's do that. Cause you're, you're the, you're the teacher. So let's play off your wheelhouse. Does that work for y'all? Urban fantasy. Well, I just said it, Chuck. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, there's two of you. I got to make sure. <laughs> yeah. Urban fantasy is All right. the plot that's in my head already that I'm kind of. All right. So about. we're going to go with a fantasy okay. in the urban fantasy subgenre. Okay. All right, now, so we immediately start thinking, all right, so there's going to be magic. Mm -hmm. There's going to be like, and I always like to use the hidden world type thing where there's magic, but they don't tell everybody because the number of people that can use magic is typically far overpopulated or underpopulated compared mm -hmm. to the number of people that can't. So they try to stay hidden because, you know, people. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now, once I have decided what uh, genre I want to work in, I have to come up with what I call the three P's. I need a person who will be a, a character in the story, the setting, a place, and the problem. They got to have a person, a place, and a problem. You got to have a character, a setting, and a plot. That's what that basically boils down to. So what, what tell me, tell me, what, what are y'all thinking? Urban fantasy setting, person. What are you thinking? Well, Sorry, I'm writing. <laughs> I kind of, okay. I kind of immediately go to kid, of course. And I've always okay. wanted to write a kid. When you say character. kid, are we talking teenager? Because I, you know, somebody in their thirties is a kid to me these days. So, what are you? You talking like uh, middle school, high school, young adult? What are we talking? Um. Well, ten. Sure. Well, yep. Try. I don't, I'm just throwing out age. Um, ages. Yeah. So, so if we're hitting a young adult market, uh, then we probably would want a young adult main character uh, to appeal to the market. A lot of our readership would be probably older, actually, 
Um, but that doesn't seem to matter because like my mom reads a lot of young adult and she's right in her. But they don't read middle middle grade. So so 10 might be a little young. So like late teens, early 20s. Is that what you're talking? Sounds good by me. What do you think? Caitlin? Good. Well, I, yeah, I'm asking you, is that, that, that what you have in mind when you say young adult? Yeah. Yeah. OK, yeah. so let's say high school senior. Okay, we're gonna do the uh, the Buffy thing here. <laughs> All right, so male or female? All right, I kind of picked the age last time, so Kayleen. Kayleen. Um. Okay, so I have a tendency to always write male main characters, um, so I'm gonna go female. Okay. We'll, female. Just, we'll just go straight on with the Buffy thing. <laughs> Let me cut All it right. right. And. Is there anything special about this person? Are like, are they a witch or are they a werewolf or are they just a, a normal kid who's about to find out shit about the world they never knew before? Like, do they know about the fantasy is basically the bottom line. All right. I'm going to go. I'm going to take an audience card audience. What do you think? Should we go with known magic where things get crazier or unknown magic where things really get crazier? Leo uh, suggests uh, an uh, insecure high school senior. And I'm glad senior. he did that because here's the thing, and I hope that everybody, I hope that y'all are picking up on it. You start basic, and then you start drilling down into the real minutia of these things. Okay, like all the questions I'm asking now, that's like the baseline. She's in high school. She's a she. She, you know, knows or doesn't know about the world, and then you can say. She's really an insecure person, which is great because that gives you a character arc for her to gain her her confidence by the end of the story. You can say, you know, any kind of things, but you want to start with the simple. Don't overthink it too fast. Mm -hmm. All right. Because basically what we're doing here is we're coming up with an outline. And then the outline, we can refine it, refine it, refine it for more details until you're actually ready to sit down and start writing this, writing the story. So I like the insecure thing. I'm going to go ahead and write that down. All right. So we're tied on the known and the unknown in the chat. For magic, whether magic. For magic. Yeah. We've got Corey and Jay Cliff wanting known. We've got Tim Kiver and Bard of Today wanting unknown. When in doubt, go to the coin. Heads, <laughs> I was going to say, they tails, got dice. unknown. That is tails, unknown. The tails character unknown. does not know about the magical world. I think that's really good because book ones are often where the main character is discovering their exactly. powers and it's an exploratory book. And then the book two and three kind of builds off of it. So if it's completely unknown from them to, to them from page one, then we can discover all of that. All right. So we're going to go. That's, that's really all you need to, to, to get a, a grasp of the basics of that character. So we've got our person. Now, where's the place? Where do we want this to be set? Now, um, I typically lean towards Southern cities cause I live in the South, but you know, the Harry Dresden books are in Chicago. I've read stuff that's set out in California New York is real popular for these kind of things. Uh, downtown Wichita. All right. <laughs> I like that. They have a coyote in there. We're going to, we're going to give a nod to Josh and Scott. <laughs> I like it. So downtown Wichita. I like that. We'll use them as our experts if we have any questions, because I've never been to Wichita. So Me neither. I've never actually, I don't think I've ever been to Kansas. I've driven through the Midwest a lot, but I don't think I've ever actually set foot in Kansas. Uh, let's see. So, which, okay, Wichita, downtown, you know, we can move all around the city, but that's good. That's our place. So we have a fantasy, urban fantasy version of Wichita, Wichita with magic. Mm -hmm. All right. We have a high school senior who's an insecure woman, young woman. Um, who is clueless about the magical world. Now that girl needs a problem. And here, here's the thing that you, you need to think about when you're thinking about the problem is that it doesn't have to be just one problem because like she could have a problem where she thinks she's being stalked by something. And then her other problem is her parents are about to get divorced and her girlfriend's fixing to break up with or whatever, you know, you can have multiple problems, but at the beginning, you want to focus on the, the problem that's going to impact the overall plot more because the smaller problems are typically going to be your subplots. 
So like if you know you want her to have relationship issues, well, you can put that as kind of a subheading under the main plot. Mm -hmm. So what uh, what what should this young lady's problem be? We probably need to give her a name, too. We're going to call her. Uh, L. All right. Well, L is insecure. Okay, so well that that is a problem. The question right. is why? Why is she insecure? Okay. Not necessarily. I mean, she could just be like, I'm insecure. But a lot, of, a lot, a lot of young people are, you know, it just kind of comes with with growing up. So I would, I would actually put that under the heading of of sub problem. What is a problem that's going to fit with the genre? Okay, there needs to be because urban fantasy typically you're going to have like a. Uh, well, an urban fantasy problem, you know, maybe she she feels like she's being stalked by a vampire or mm -hmm. she's starting to feel weird when there's a full moon or, you know, something that the problem should be something that's going to allow her to intersect with the the hidden world. You know, the thing that's going to it's it's going to move into the apparent missing. I like that. OK, one. I like that one. One of her parents has gone missing. Maybe the cops have given up on it. Maybe, uh, you know, something's going on and she feels compelled to investigate it herself. And this leads to her discovering the fantasy aspect of her world. You know, maybe she's working with Lieutenant Moon to try and figure out what's going on. Who knows? But I like maybe that. She hires Lieutenant Moon because she's like. Who's, who's left the force and is a, is a hard bitten P.I., or the the <laughs> high the high school security officer because he oh, screwed up go. he screwed up at, at police something or other right okay so now we're getting into now you're going to flesh out the cast stuck in I like how we're doing high school okay so do we like, like parent missing a parent I, like, I like that parent missing I'm gonna right, put uh, in, police has given up and she's talking dad she's been talking to the security wait, dude wait so the police gave up on her parent missing because maybe her parents like often missing, often gone missing. Maybe her parents well, are here, drug addict or something. This, how and, about this one? Dad, dad came up missing or, or it could be mom, whichever mm -hmm. dad came up missing, but the cops are convinced that mom did it. Cause you know, that's kind of people who've been married a long time tend to want to kill each other. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but she, she is, she's convinced something else happened. So the cops are focused on the mom while she's exploring other avenues. Does that, does that sound good? That makes sense. Yeah. I, okay. mean, it, I mean, it would be like, especially if there's, you know, if we throw in like the, the typical evidence of, but they can't prove it because it's, it's uh, what do they call it? The thing that they call it. <laughs> The evidence. It's, it's not there's it's not enough evidence to use. Right. It's all circumstantial. circumstantial. Yes. All right. So again, though, right now at this stage, we're just doing the baseline. All the stuff that y'all are coming up with is great, but that's going to be for kind of the second pass where you start really fleshing everything out. See, this is the, this is why we need a Papa Chuck in our ear because <laughs> I, I overthink things too quickly. And this is why right. I, ended up with I like get it. Five I get drafts. it. And it's perfectly fine to make little notes in the market. If you look at one of my notebooks before I do a, before I do a story, I mean, there, there's little jo things jotted down all over the, well, it's way over there, but there's things jotted all over the place that I have to come back to. And, oh, yeah, I wanted to do that, you know. So it's probably fine. But right now, like I said, we're just trying to get the baseline. It's really hard to control that excitement when that ball gets real, that story ball starts churning up inside so of you. You have a secondary thing and you're like, of, that's a good idea. Exactly. So right so, now we're going to say dad is missing. Police focused on mom. L thinks otherwise. So just to reiterate, um, now that we've kind of got like that starting baseline, when you first come into this outline, you want to you want to focus on what's your overall genre and your subgenre that you're going to be focused on, which is going to help you find those tropes as you're going through this process. And then once you get that figured out, we're working off of a fantasy in um, urban paranormal. Wait. Yeah, urban fantasy. Urban it's, fantasy. It's a pretty broad definition Super. but yeah <laughs> and then you need to go into you need to find your your main character so you need your your 
main person. Well, now here's the thing. You need a person and typically it's going to be your protagonist. But I have had instances where I actually started out with the bad guy. So you, you just know, need some person. Some person a, you need on. a person in a place who has a problem. All right. So you need a person, place, and a problem of their own. So, and that, I like that, that, that definition, because that's sometimes where I will get stuck. I get stuck in the big problem and I forget that the character themselves have their own personal problem. So then when I realize I'm like, oh crap, I've been, you know, floating out in Neverland this whole time. I have to come back to the beginning and figure out what was that character's main starting headspace, you know, after I've been three weeks into this. Right. I like to think of it when I'm when I'm doing this, I like to think of it as I'm looking through a camera into this imaginary world with a telephoto lens and I am zoomed in on Lauren, who lives in the fantasy world. And once I got a good feel for who Lauren is and what her situation is, I pull the I pull the zoom back and it zooms out and makes the world a little bit bigger. And I see the things in her immediate surroundings. And then I zoom it out a little bit further and I see the broader world, how the, how the culture work, how the, the political systems work. All of these things aren't going to necessarily directly affect the story, but it does give you a feel for this character and, and the world they live in. And that is going to inform decisions that that character and slash you, that character makes in, in relations to the story. So, so when I'm at this point in it, I'm always focused on that character that's going to carry the reader through the story. Hmm. Who is this person? And, and, and especially if I'm writing something like the current, my current work in progress that I'm doing for Athon is really, it's a first person narrative that never leaves for three books, never leaves the perspective of the main character. So I had to have a really good feel for Jack and who he was and how he sees things and the smart and stupid things that he's going to do along the way while still keeping in mind that he doesn't necessarily live in a world like I live in and has a very different worldview because he knows things that the average person doesn't. But when I first started out, it was just one or two lines about who he was and that's it. But then over time, as I said, I pulled back that zoom I saw more and more of, of how his, how he would react within his world. So right. you see what I'm saying there? So oh, yeah. again, it's like, it's like, it's like building a layer cake, you know, right now we're doing the base layer and then Getting we'll put a, a little crumble. frosting on. That's all your subplots and your little supporting characters. And then we'll put another layer on another layer. Another layer. Eventually it's, you've got the whole story in the whole setting. It's all just, right. so it's, we've it's got our process. genre, our sub genre. We've got at least one character in a place with a problem. Where do we go from here next, Popchuck? All right, so we know we have a fantasy. We know we have a teenager whose dad is missing. We know the cops aren't really interested in anything she has to say because they think the mom did it. She's convinced otherwise. We know that she lives in Wichita. So after that, once I've got those things, I like to think about what, when I actually want to start writing, I like to think about what is her average day? We need to give the reader a sense of what is her normal? Mm. What's her normal? That way, when we screw it up, they'll kind of have, they'll have the same sense of what the hell, hopefully, as the character does. Because, you know, they've got this normal and then we're going to have the inciting incident and all that stuff to screw up the normal. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? Do we want to have, excuse me. Do we want to have her normal, maybe like she's heading out to school and on the same, on the same day that, uh, my art guys just showed up. Sorry. Um, I forgot about them. Um, on the same day, her dad actually disappears, you know, that, I mean, that would probably be like the easiest way to put her in an actual normal unless we wanted her current normal to be the already stress of being in this situation where the cops are giving up and not searching anymore. Yeah. I was actually thinking, um, you could do a, you know, she goes to school, you, you kind of introduce how insecure she is and what her, her more personal problems are. And then, you know, and this doesn't have to necessarily be just one chapter or one scene. It could go over a couple. It just depends on the pay, how, how you want the story paced. 
but um, having the the normalcy interrupted by her coming home to a bunch of police cars That's and exactly what Leo was saying. Ah, it moved, shifted, sorry, coming back home from school. Police exactly. And then if you wanted to, once you, that, I mean, because her dad coming up missing could be your inciting incident. Mm -hmm. You know, coming home to the to the cops at your house and all that. That that is what kind of first intersects your character with the plot, mm -hmm. right? That's the inciting incident. That's where normal shifts to abnormal. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry. Give me one second, okay? Mm -hmm. I got to go deal with this. Y'all discuss this some more. I'll be right back. You're good. All right. So I like this. We've got we've got that genre. We've got that subgenre. Which for some authors they get really confused. Like even myself with my first series, I wrote the story without really thinking about where it fit in the world of genres. So then it was like I was playing catch up with with my story and, and how to place it in, in genre land. Um, so I like starting there. I mean, like I was saying before, we'll give you an idea of tropes to hit, mm -hmm. um, tenses to go for, you know, vibes that like, you know, is it going to be darker? Is it going to be humorous? It can, it can help you kind of pinpoint those jump off points. Yeah. And at this point, I'm kind of thinking about all the different possibilities where we could take this. I'm thinking about the different kinds of magic or creatures or problems. You know, is the dad, um, is he caught up in the the larger magic that's in the world? Is he caught up in some kind of larger conspiracy that's that's part of the, the urban fantasy genre? Um, so I'm kind of flooded by all of these options and choices in my head. And that's when there's too many choices, then I, I start to think about something else, like not writing, like getting up and doing something else. So Kayleen, what do you do when you have all these choices? Just just pick one and move forward. So yeah, I just try to, I just, I just write until. So sorry you know, about that guys. No, you're good. I just write until I get like, you know, the idea out of my head. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I know that it's, that it's not going to make it into the story, but I have to get it out. Otherwise right. it's just going to keep fluttering in there. So you write it down. Yeah. Even if you're just going to not use it, just write it write down. down. Get it out of my head. All right. Okay. So back. Sorry. No, you're uh, good. So her normal day comes home. Dad is missing inciting incident. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's where she intersects with the plot. Mm -hmm. So you could do like a, if you wanted to drag out the investigation, you know, you could have her like getting all the details, but I, I'm thinking, if you wanted a faster pace, you maybe do a chapter with a heading that's like three weeks later or mm -hmm. something like that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or it just, again, depends on how you want to pace it. Yeah. So now we have our normal day. Then we have our inciting incident, which is cops showing up saying your dad's missing, something like that. Now we need our lock in. Now the lock, mean? lock in. So some, you have a normal day, something weird happens to screw up the normal day. You could just say, well, that's my new life. That's the new normal. I'm just going to accept the fact that my dad's missing and I'm never going to do anything. But that's not really what protagonists do. They what something needs to happen that makes the character commit to to the to a new countering the pro to solving the problem. You it's, see what I'm saying? Right. It's that the police turn their focus on the mom and they're convinced or they're trying to they're trying see, but to like, paint but her why as why would she have any 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 reason to doubt like she she would need that something to make her doubt that the police is you know, expertise. Right. What? Other than just like, I mean, cause you know, when you think about it, it's like, yes, I love my mother, but could she have, I mean, she got really mad at him the yeah, other day. She could, just, she could just take the cops at their word. I mean, let's face it. They're the cops. They're investigators. This is what they're trained to do. So if they say mom did it. So what is something that, and bear in mind our genre here, you know, maybe somebody comes to her and says, you know, this isn't something the police can handle or so somebody brought up the uh, security guard at the school. Lieutenant yeah. Boone. Huh? Like what if he like catches her before she's like, you know, the bell rings and he just says something really obscure and weird. 
right? It has absolutely no meaning to anything at that point. Right. But then she gets home and she's just like, oh my God, cops, what's going on? But then something like the cops are talking and she remembers, Lieutenant Moon. Right. (laughs) Right. So if we want her to be the one person who's willing to go against what the police are saying and kind of, as I said, lock herself into, all right, I'm going to discover the truth. Then something has to happen that makes her realize there's a different truth to be discovered. So maybe she's at school. You know, you have that classic scene where it's like after school and she's going to go to practice and she's in the locker room alone and something supernatural happens to convince her that things are not weird. Yeah. Things are weirder than she thought. And then the, the creepy old security guard is the guy who shows up and sort of takes on the mentorship role of, yeah, you know, there are monsters in the world and I think your dad got taken by one of them, but you obviously can't tell the cops that because the cops are going to think think you're crazy. crazy. (laughs) Exactly. You know, so there needs to be something that convinces her that they need to do that. A really good example of uh, this kind of thing I thought was in uh, it, you know, any of these kids on bikes kinds of stories where all the adults don't believe that there's anything crazy happening, but the kids know and they have to do something about it because they know and nobody will listen to them. Well, that's kind of the situation I think she would find herself in, you know, something, go ahead. We had a suggestion, you know, with Lieutenant Moon being Moon, uh, that he would actually be a werewolf. That's possible. That would he could be the bridge between her and the supernatural world, mm-hmm. you know. And maybe there's some, you know, maybe he's like the the good natured werewolf, and then there's some others who aren't quite so good natured, and they took the dad, and he he doesn't really know what they did with him, but he's going to guide her into this world to try to find the truth. Well, then you have a, then you have the the supporting character and you have to, what's his motivation? Why would he want to help? You know, was he cursed against his will or something? And this is just what he does. Or so you have to start exploring his character on your second pass through. But let's just say that Lieutenant, we'll we'll call him Lieutenant Moon, Mm -hmm. uh, saves her from an attack. So I have a, I I don't know how we're going to fit, if we can fit this in, but like, I was just um, jumping back a few paces, you know, that the, the locker room situation. um, So it could be, you know, where they still have to change clothes, you know, for gym and whatnot. And, you know, some people put pictures in their little lockers that they have. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what kind of power she has yet. I know that's probably not even close to. Well, there's not, there's not necessarily anything to say that she will. We haven't decided that yet. What? But I'm I I am I just I just I was imagining her sitting there. She opened her locker, you know. She you glance at like one of those pictures, but something weird happens in the picture, and she's sort of like, "What?" But then it's different from what it was before, or something. I don't know. Right, because we still have to attack the problem of why why was the dad taken? Was he just a random victim, or was there something special about his bloodline? And it's going to show up in her, you know. But again, this is all second pass stuff. Okay. So right now we have our inciting incidents, which is the dad (laughs) coming up missing. And then we're going to have our lock in where Lieutenant Moon saves her from the attack and explains that there's a supernatural world underneath the real world. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So got our inciting incident, got our lock in first pinch point. Pinch point. Um, So for anybody who doesn't know, um, pinch points in a story are kind of the moments where you, excuse me, where you really show the reader what the protagonist is up against. Um, they're often called first and second battle, but they're really those moments when, when you see the, when you show the reader, the odds, like, You know, you show that, oh, okay, this this thing that wants to disrupt my life is really bigger than me, is a lot bigger than me. And it kind of puts your protagonist, your protagonist 
kind of back on their heels. Like, yeah, the poo hits the fan. That's great, Corey. I like the way that he put that. You know, and that's and that's a it's a way for the and it really if you've created a, a sympathetic um, protagonist, it it really makes the reader go, oh shit, I don't want this big nasty monster thing to kill my my newly you know my new friend the protagonist over here. So, what could we now that we have somebody in L's life who understands the supernatural world? How do we bring in the overwhelming odds of the the antagonist who we actually haven't met yet, really, and show that okay, she's really up against enormous odds here. What what can we do to do that? I feel like there should be some kind of clan war that her dad got caught up in. See, there you go. And Since we're gonna make Moon's a werewolf, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, and and Moon's. I don't know if he's necessarily on the good side, but he's on a side. Yeah. Or, or he's, he's a, or he's like, he's like a lone, or he's like yeah, a he's lone wolf. He's the lone one who's wolf. outside the clans. He, yeah. He's bad enough that he can fight off anybody he needs to fight off. He, he might be like, from, from a side. Scott could do that. Scott's right. Just, you know, he might be from a side, but now he's kind of, he's in this, this high school. So he's kind of separated, but who are the players? Who are the other clans? Right. Oh, and Patricia had a good one. Other people like start that. disappearing. Oh, you know? yeah. Similar That's to a good one. Yep. So um, let's say that, where am I here? Seven six. Um, so uh, Lieutenant Moon, he, should we make him a wear coyote? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. Um, so he introduces her like, look, kid, this is, you know, this is the way it is. I think your dad got caught up in something. And, you know, maybe he offers to help her. Maybe he tells her to go home and forget about it because it's bigger than she is. But then other people start disappearing and she she dives in anyway and has to square off with a real like she maybe she finds a pattern to the disappearances. And at some point she tries to save somebody on her own and has to end up squaring off with a real big badass werewolf. And, you know, doesn't really understand what that means and has to be saved. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then we could get in. And then later we get into Lieutenant Moon teaching her how to fight, how to fight these things. And we get into why her dad was chosen. You know why he was victimized is there something special about her maybe she's the you know we go back to the buffy thing maybe she's the slayer mm -hmm. and she just doesn't know it yet you know maybe her dad was the slayer or the grim or whatever you want to call him so what what would that that first if we're going to stick with the werewolf motif i think at some point she has she has to encounter a werewolf and do very poorly against it <laughs> right right um yeah, and may maybe needs to be saved, or maybe she just fails in that first. Right, in that first the, encounter. The, the werewolf encounter. gets the victim. She doesn't. She doesn't get to save him, but she gets a glimpse of what she's facing. Right. You know, and what that means. So I'm going to put encounters werewolf. Victim dies. I like the idea of the dad being a grim. Yeah, something like that. Kind of the whole Slayer thing. That yeah, some kind of some cool. kind of yeah. yeah, some kind of. I really Slayer. enjoyed that show. Um, well, and when I I think of Wichita, I think of you know like like Native Americans are out there, First Peoples are out there, and there's like you know powers that could be associated with the earth or animals or something, and maybe um, in her bloodline is some kind of ability that her dad has, and maybe right. it's awakening some kind her. of maybe maybe she, maybe they are Native American. You yeah. know, and there's there's some kind of uh, of traditional Native American hunter that runs through their bloodline, a chosen one, so to speak. And their whole deal is they take on shape changers and tricksters and, and just all they're, they're monster hunters for all mm. intents and purposes. Mm -hmm. I think back you know, in and, the past, you know, before uh, it became urban, they're more like um, like, you know, like Naruto and there's the 
the clan. Is that anime? Because if it's anime, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> well, okay, so think I'm ninja, old, ninja tribes, right? Not everyone right. in the ninja tribe tribes. Okay, ninja, that I get. Yeah. But there's like the whole school, so people, you know, innately can, you know, learn to be ninja. So it's like it could be something along the lines of that, where she's or, not necessarily yeah. a chosen one, but because it's it's been so long since there's actually been a tribal school of it, it's it's rare to come across those innate to the tribe. See, that's great. That's that's a real that's a really good way to go with it. You can just kind of build on that whole, okay, well, I've got to pour through the ancient texts to understand this stuff kind of thing. See, that's really good. But for right now, yeah. as our first battle, we're going to have encounter with werewolf, victim dies. So she now really has a firsthand understanding of the kind of power that she's up against. And she understands the consequences of failing. You know, mm -hmm. it's not it's not just her. These monsters are killing a lot of people. All right. So that's our first battle. Now we get to our midpoint. Now the midpoint is that's the shift. That's the fulcrum of the story. That's where the protagonist goes from being a victim to being a warrior. That's when they decide, oh, that's when they start learning how to fight back and they come up with a plan for doing so. And, you know, they, so at this, like in my head, at this point, this is after she sees this person die, that's when she goes back to Lieutenant Moon and convinces him to help her solve this problem. She becomes more proactive as opposed to reactive. Right. That's yeah. what your midpoint is. So I'm thinking at this point, she, um, she would just go back and say, look, this is happening. You can't sit here hiding in the high school as the school cop. Uh, you gotta, you gotta teach me how to do this. Maybe she's had some inkling of an internal power that she doesn't understand, you know, like a slayer kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and she needs his help, but she go, she needs to go from being this insecure reactive character to being this, all right, we have to do something about this kind of character. You know, she goes from victim to warrior. So you guys like that? She just goes mm -hmm. back to the lieutenant and says, hey, man, it's time yeah, to put up she or can, shut up. You know, she can have that moment after that battle, right? She's been working with him, you know, and maybe not entirely believing it, but enough of what he's saying is making sense. And then, you know, that, holy crap, someone just died in front of me. Right. And that, <laughs> right? that, and that, it's like that can be that, a very... Been, that could you know, be a very pivotal moment in a person's life. Like, yeah. I need to protect myself because they're not going to stop hunting me. Exactly. <laughs> and then he knows shit. And it could be she needs to convince him to actually train her. Yeah. Um, I mean, it could the be whole that lone wolf thing is great, but, you know, maybe he's isolating himself on purpose because, you know, he's kind crazy. of established that. Yeah, but, you know, among the werewolf clans, he's kind of established that he's on his own, but he doesn't want to constantly keep proving it. So he just tries to you know, stay out of sight. So he's having this low key life out in Wichita, you know, hunting coyotes on the full moons and stuff. And her parents didn't necessarily want her to know any of this or to get exactly. involved with any of this, even if maybe like her dad knows, but maybe her mom doesn't even know. Well, and it, yeah, maybe the mom doesn't about know this either. Or, you know, maybe we have to come up with some sort of way that the mom does know. And there has to be a confrontation between the two of them. You know, right. mom was trying to protect her and be a good mom, but yeah, send her know, to college, you, keep her in normal right. society, and not. Exactly. You, know, you could go yeah. back to like the mom and dad's, um, you know, past where it was like one of the last remaining schools, and they actually went through that training, and they actually witnessed some of that crap. Through it, their own little side story, you know, they end up getting married, and she's pregnant, and like we can't do this anymore, and then they escape to Wichita. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it could be that her, you know, maybe she's been lied to about her, her family history on her father or mo either her mother or father's side uh, about what it, what this life leads to, you know, maybe it's just bloody and tragic because all of her ancestors died trying to save other safe strangers from all the, you know, hunting monsters and saving people like supernatural, but you know, maybe it's just bloody and tragic and they just didn't want that for her. So they've tried to protect her from it, but now, exactly. yeah. you know, this is think shit happens and you can't escape destiny in, in most fiction. I really want mom to be like, okay. So I'm like, she's just like, you know, she's so <laughs> it. it's, she it's almost impossible thing. not to do that. Isn't it? <laughs> right. Like it's her, it's, she's the mom thing. And then like, she comes to find out mom actually has like some badassness 
It's like, is this why you have so many knives on your wall on the wall? Yeah. Like, is that why you have this weird obsession, mom? And she's just, just like, all right, let me teach you a few things. <laughs> right? She's like, I'm a little rusty, but that's why there's a crossbow under the oven. Hmm. <laughs> Okay, so we decided that for our midpoint, she's going to go from victim to warrior by going back to Lieutenant Moon and saying, look, man, I understand you're trying to keep it on the down low, but I need somebody to tell me what's going on so that I can do something about it and convincing him to train slash help her. Does that sound good? So that's our midpoint. That's our, our uh, that's the seventh point in the story. So now for number eight, we're going to go to our second pinch point. Now, the first pinch point showed us that the bad guy, the antagonist, is this big, you know, just overwhelmingly scary thing that, that the protagonist really doesn't see a way of defeating. Then we get to the midpoint where they decide to t shift their mindset from this, from being intimidated by this scary thing to coming up with a way to fight this scary thing. The second pinch point is where they actually enact that plan, take it to the monster and lose. Bum, now, bum, bum. Losing doesn't mean that they get killed necessarily. It just means that their plan doesn't work. You know, maybe they fight really hard, but end up having to run away or maybe Lieutenant moon gets captured or anything like that. That's our second pinch point. So she's more confident. She has, she has a plan. She has some skills, but something goes wrong in that second battle. So what do we want to go wrong? Does Lieutenant Moon get captured by the evil werewolves? Does she get captured by the evil werewolves? Do one of them, or does you couldn't really hurt her, but does Lieutenant Moon get severely injured and have to be hospitalized? What, what do we want to happen in that second battle to set her back on her heels um, about, about what she's trying to do, even though the ultimate goal of finding out what happened to her dad still needs to be achieved because that's ultimately the driving force here. She wants to find her dad, find out what happened to him and prove to the cops her mom is innocent. So what could set her back on her heels there? Patricia says losing the mentor would be a big problem. Yeah, well, I, I, typically this is really we're, we're really kind of getting into the the hero's journey kind of stuff here, and for that you don't want to lose a mentor in the in the first cycle. So um, I agree with that, but he could be hurt. Mm -hmm. You know, he could be there. Could be some way he could be taken out of the fight without necessarily completely losing him. Right. You know. So what what do you what do you think should be good? Maybe the mom. Something happens with the mom. You know, yeah, I was, I was, my mind keeps going back to the mom and, um, either like, and see, like, if, if she's trying to convince, I don't know if this is going to play a part in it because this is where I get too far into the weeds when I'm doing my own stuff. But like, if the mom goes missing too, you know, what's that reaction going to be with the cops? Are they not going to reopen their investigation? Are they going to be rethinking what's happening? Um, because we don't necessarily want them to know about the Native American werewolf. Uh, you know, magic fight thing going on. Yeah, maybe right. they've backed off. Maybe they've decided they don't have the evidence they need to prove anything about the mom. So they've backed off of her, but then she does something that gets in the daughter's way. Maybe at this point she comes out and says, I know what you're doing and you need to stop. You know, or she or maybe they they're they're trying to confront the the evil werewolves that they think have uh the, the dad or has killed the dad or whatever has happened to the dad. And maybe mom shows up and starts bossing them around. She's like, what are you or, doing here? Yeah. Crazy. What you have know? you, so, oh, is she could, maybe she doesn't know that her daughter's been sneaking out and training with moon. Yeah. But then what, what, what would she be doing? You know, what well, is she I mean, doing she with would, a bunch she of werewolves? She would know her daughter's been acting weird and. Yeah, you know, she's, that's true. She's, and then she, she like follows her. You know, like. she might chalk the weirdness up to her daughter, you know, the, the dad being missing and the, and the daughter trying to prove her mom's innocence. And but and if the, if the, the mom, mom knows, wanting her to let it go. But if the mom knows about this, this secondary fantasy world, 
And she's either, you know, her own impression with this Lieutenant Moon that she keeps seeing her daughter around a little bit too close. Like she keeps catching them after a conversation or after a training session. And she's just like, who is this dude? You know, right. And, you know, she would she would start putting two and two together that her daughters put two and two together. Maybe she's mm-hmm. been doing her own investigation. I don't know. So, she's, so yeah. in my head, what I, what what's jumping out? Because for me, I don't know how it works for you guys, but for me, when I'm when I'm doing this, when I'm writing, I basically uh, there's a bunch of TVs in my head, mm-hmm. and I just describe whatever's on which screen I happen to be watching at that particular moment. You know, there's always four or five of them going at one time. It's very noisy up here. And what I'm seeing here is Lieutenant, either um, the Lieutenant and L go in to confront the bad guy or the bad guy's guys, whatever. And mom shows up and she, and, and L discovers that the mom is somehow tied to the evil werewolves. Like she's so I was just gonna say, are you gonna are you gonna put in a twist there that the mom's actually part of an opposite? Yeah, well, but she's not necessarily like an active part, but she has some kind of history over them with them that allows her to come in and basically say, All right, this fight's over. So maybe it's a couple of setbacks. Maybe during the course of the confrontation, uh Lieutenant gets hurt. L's back on her heels, fixing to to get it. And then mom shows up and says, all right, stop. And the werewolves just stop for whatever reason. We'll have to determine that reason later. But the setback could be, A, they physically lost the confrontation, didn't find out much more about the dad, and finds out that mom's been keeping secrets. And how they had to keep control. And they actually have something to do with what happened to dad but just not in the way the cops thought. Right. How does that sound? Yeah. I like it. Okay. So I'm going to put in uh, loses fist fight. Finds out mom is tied to wolves, to evil wolves. Bad wolves. Bad wolf. All right, so that's our second pinch point. Now we go to the long dark night of the soul or the black moment, as it's called. And this mm-hmm. is the point where the, sorry, <laughs> where the protagonist is on the verge of giving up. She's at her lowest point. She doesn't see a way out, but she still has to struggle through somehow. You know, she really doesn't see that she can win, but she needs to find out the truth. You know, this this is this is the really even in uh, a hardcore thrillers and action books like I just listened to the I finished uh, reading, not listening to reading the uh, the gray man, the first book in the gray man series that, mm. that Josh has been after me to, yeah. to, to read. Even in that, the black moment is almost always a really emotional thing. You know, because you're getting into the protagonist and they're they're just at their lowest point. They just they you know, it's it's that I just I can't I just can't anymore. I can't. But I have to. You know, it's that that despair that kind of comes over them where they just, you know, the, you know, they may not be like all weepy about it, but they're still they don't have that emotional fuel to power through to solve the, the big the to answer the big question. So for her, we see that her mentor has been injured. Her mom apparently is keeping secrets from her. And, you know, that's a trust, just like uh, Patricia's saying here, that, that that's a trust that's broken, you know, and she's, she's qu- suddenly questioning everything about her, uh, reality as she knows it. You know, that's, that's a hard place to be in. But at the same time, she still wants to find her dad. You know, because that's that. So what, you know, for that moment, you have to show the despair, but then have something happen that makes them power through anyway. 
You know, like in the Gray Man book, uh, his ultimate goal is to rescue a family that's been kidnapped. But he gets beaten and bad because it's it's basically a, a John Wick type thing where it's just fight after fight after fight after fight. And by the time he reaches the black moment in that book, he is just he is beat to hell and gone. And he does not see a way that he can successfully accomplish saving these people that he has history with. And the way it gets resolved is even though he still has that feeling, he gets a phone call from one of the like eight, nine year old girls from the family. Someone manipulates her into calling him and saying, oh, I know you're going to come and save us and da, da, da. You know, and he's like, mother. (laughs) (laughs) So despite being all beat to hell and not really having a, a hard, solid plan to his name, he gets up and goes anyway. You know, so you've got your black moment where he's about to accept defeat. But then you have that thing that happens that pushes him over that that despair. So so her despair, we've just kind of outlined her mom has lied to her. Her friend is injured. Her dad's still missing. The world is way crazier than she thought it was going to be. What is going to help push her over that? What's going to what, what do we want to have? That, that gets her over that hump. And she's like, you know what, live or die. I'm going to go do this. Well, part, part of the issue is she feels that betrayal, right? What's been motivating her so far is to save her mom, right? From the police officers. But then she finds out that her mom's actually like, maybe her mom's a bad guy too. Mm-hmm. Or, or at least tied to them. Or in some tied way. to the tied Or maybe to the dad guy. disappeared because of mom, something she did or knew or whatever. So what, what could get you up and motivating motivated in the face of betrayal? Well, I mean, it could be her and mom have a little heart to heart and mom explains the situation and explains, you know, maybe she tells her your dad is not dead. This other thing has happened, but he's going to be dead soon. And there's nothing I can do about it, even though I'm tied to these other people. Maybe, Dad's going to die and it's mom's fault, you know, but maybe finding out that dad isn't actually dead would make her say, okay, you know what? I have to, I can't, I can't just sit here knowing my dad's in the clutches of the bad guys when I could do something about it, you know, as risky as it may be. And she just goes, you know, I, I also, I also think, you know, not trying to get too deep into the mom, but, um, you know, she'd just be like, I, I shouldn't have even come, but I wasn't just going to let you die. I probably made the, the situation even worse just coming. So we just need to sit, sit here and it'll be fine. He's not dead. Just, you know, calm it down. Okay. Just like, <laughs> How about mom fesses up that she has history with this pack of werewolves, whatever that might be. Dad is still alive until maybe there's a ritual they need to perform and it's on a certain night or something, whatever. There's a clock on it at this point. And mom, knowing how dangerous it is, says, all right, fine, let's go get your dad. Maybe the mom coming clean and saying, "Okay, your other friend got hurt, but I'm going to load my crossbow and you and I are going to go rescue your father despite the odds. Maybe mom dies in the attempt at the end. And it's just dad and daughter after that. You know, you see what I'm saying, though? Maybe that that show of support from mom turns out mom's not necessarily the most honest person. But maybe in the end, she actually, you know, she was just somebody in a tough spot. It makes right. her a little more empathetic. Right. Well, maybe the the big baddie is a lot is a lot stronger and more powerful. And she just thought going along with him was the safest for everybody. Right. Um. But but now, you know, push comes to shove. She's gone with her daughter to, to go. And- right. Maybe, maybe maybe the whole thing is, you know, mom's playing it safe. Yeah. And L pushes the whole but we're family thing. And it, it kind of maybe L just lays a big fat guilt trip on mom that she deserves. Yeah, it's kind of playing off of what Facebook user. Sorry, you're a Facebook user. We don't know who you are. We don't know who you are. Um, she wants to show her mom that she's not like her. She's better more just honest. She wants to show that being betrayed won't make her become vengeful evil. Yeah. And maybe, you know, and maybe that by having Elle show that to her mom, it 
it sort of guilts her mom into going, well, shit. All right, fine. <laughs> well, that's the difference. In a lot of YA books look at, you know, grow, growing up stories. The kids starts out, some kids start out kind of black and white. And then when they become adults, they see the world in more shades of gray. So not, maybe the mom is in that shades of gray spot. And it's actually the, the kid who's like, no, but we got to, it's dead. We love him. We need exactly. To go for exactly. him and save him no matter what. We wouldn't what. just let you be we taken wouldn't. off to be sacrificed under the full moon. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to write uh, L confronts mom. They team up to save dad. Because that's the bare bones of it, right? That's mm. the bottom line. Yep. I'm trying really hard not to get into the I know you I are. hope you know this, Chuck. It is, I, it, but, but so you see where I'm going with this, though? Yeah. yeah you, you see how this could make it a lot more structured for you? And you don't have to figure... I used to be like that. I'd just go crazy. You know, back right. in the day, my head would just go everywhere. And I found that by really structuring it and breaking it down, you yeah. can stay a lot more focused. And when we're done, these 11 points, they basically give you targets to write towards. Gotcha. You know, you, you start off with the with the three basic things, the person to place the problem. And when you start writing, you say, OK, I know I have to get from their average day to the inciting incident. And I know what their average day is like and I know what the inciting incident is. And you can basically discovery write between those two points. It's all the fun bits that and that's where the fun stuff is. And that's where you can kind of let everything go crazy and just dump shit on the page because you can always pull stuff out in the edits in the second draft. So that's that's why I like this method, because it allows me to be a little structured. But at the same time, there's plenty of discovery writing to have fun with. All right. OK, so, so now uh, number, 10. number 10 is going to be the battle royale, the final confrontation with the bad guy. Will we save dad? Won't we save dad? In my books, this tends to be a lot of action. Because I, you know, I, I write adventure thriller kind of, you know, I, I, I'm a guy. I like that adventure stuff. So I just put confrontation. And this is just really here, you just figure out where they face off with the bad guy, how bad they get beat up by the bad guy before they ultimately defeat him, assuming they defeat him or chase him off or whatever. And, and you know, if you want a happy ending, you save the, the dad. Um, maybe the mom dies during the confrontation. Maybe, maybe Lieutenant Moon shows up the last minute because he just can't let his, his protege go into battle alone and he shakes off his wounds and, you know, and comes in for a, for a seventh inning save or something. So really for me, this is like, this is the one I, I, I can, I have a general idea of of where I want it to take place and how I want it to take place. But I don't have a lot of details going in in the confrontation because so much of the yeah. writing is going to feed into what logically can take place there. When I was teaching this with the thriller example, the only thing I would have for confrontation, I, typically for that one, I would have, there was a, a detective in Atlanta chasing a serial killer. And because it was a real world thing and with no fantasy elements, I would just have a showdown with serial killer at the Georgia Aquarium, hmm. you know, because it's always dark and shadowy in there. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a cool place. Acting for lights. Right. And you don't know if he's going to stab a, a goer or something, you know, you just don't know. So for confrontation, really, I just say I keep it very simple because a lot of that discovery writing we're talking about is going to play into how the confrontation plays out. So since we're in Wichita, I don't really know a lot about Wichita. Um, we, we were talking about the American Indian thing, the native American thing. Um, you know, maybe is there a, maybe somebody knows, but is there like a, a native American, is there a reservation there? Is there, like some kind of sacred Native American lands. Maybe there's a landmark nearby where there, you know, we I mentioned earlier, maybe dad's going to be sacrificed at some sort of full ritual, ritual yeah. or something. Mm -hmm. So we would have like a ritual site and they show up to disrupt the ritual. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I, that that is really all I would write. 
Mm. They show up at the ritual site to save dad. Yeah, because also going into, especially if you're like, I really want to do a story set in uh, Seattle, but you've never been to Seattle. Right. Um, keeping it broad in like this very beginning outline, because then afterwards, then, you know, you start fleshing things out. That's when you can really be like, OK, study the maps, look up the things. With the, I use the, Google I, like the, the trilogy I've been writing is set in Atlanta. And I know quite, a, you know, I've been to Atlanta a lot, but I still have to use Google Earth and all this stuff to, to kind of get a feel for where these scenes are actually taking place. So, yeah, for, for this, I would be leaning on Scott and Josh and and Google Earth a lot to uh, to get a feel for Wichita. Um, so yes, for our final confrontation, uh, I'm going to have, they show up at the ritual site to save dad. I'm going to put down that mom dies. I think that would be a good kind of ending for her arc. You know, maybe she sacrifices herself to save L. Does that sound all right? Yeah. I'm okay. sorry, mom. <laughs> uh, one so, of those, but she has to die. <laughs> yes. Joaquin says she needs to prove to herself that she won't be like her mom. She'll take the harder path. And in the end, maybe her mom can change or die when she yes. sees her daughter being a good person, despite being betrayed. Exactly. He also said uh, they do have a barn where in the 1800s, a Wendigo is believed to have killed 18 young oh, those women. Those are great monsters. Wendigos they are really good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, okay. Something like that. Maybe, maybe instead of werewolves, they're Wendigos. I don't know. Um, all right. So all our confrontation, she shows up, she shows that she's learned how to fight. They mm -hmm. fight off the bad guys. Mom dies in some, you know, heroic way or something. Um, she manages to save her dad. So problem solved. They have dad. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now that part's over. I always have um, maybe a chapter or two at the end that I call new normal. Even in, even in books in a series, there needs to be some slight change to the world after the big thing. So now we need to say, okay, dad's home. Mm -hmm. um, but he's crippled and he can't be a Right. Maybe he's walking with a cane. He can't be a strong rim anymore. Yeah, and they find out that the police are connected to the bad guys. Yeah, well, I'm glad you said that because I was going to tell you what I like to use these new normals about. Yeah, because I'm like, um, man, the police are going to be really tripped up because dad's back, now mom's gone. <laughs> yeah, they have to come up, maybe they have to come up with some kind of lie about how mom died, you know, to explain the, you know, maybe Lieutenant uh, Moon helps them figure out, yeah, this, you just tell them it was a cult or, you know, you come up with something to just kind of play it off. And people who read these kind of books are kind of forgiving about that whole secret world stuff. You know, yeah. it, it's because they expect it and, and, and you don't have to get too in the weeds about that. But let's say dad's home, but he's crippled. They shredded one of his legs so bad he has to walk with a cane now, but he still, he tells her the whole truth of her family. Um, so him and Lieutenant Moon are kind of her mentors now. Uh, they need a bromance. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, something like that. And now I like, if I'm right, especially when I'm writing a series, I tend to do trilogies. I tend to think in trilogies. I always like to have some sort of hint for the next of book. What's going to happen? Yeah, what's what's right. going to happen? Like, that's, that is definitely a thing that I wanted to talk about too, was because some authors was like, okay, I wrote the first book. I know I need, you know, three of them, but how do I conclude that? But then like get people excited about the second. Right. Shook. <laughs> so you, I, I don't like to do really hardcore cliffhangers. You know, I want the vast majority of the questions in my books to be answered by the end of the novel. I don't ever want my readers to feel like I'm trying to manipulate them into getting the next book. Hmm. So I will leave small questions unanswered in a book um, that, that kind of gives the reader the option of, hey, you know what? That's pretty good. I'm going to go see what's up with this other one. And if it's a small enough question, they'll just be like, eh, I don't care. You know, if it's a bad, if they didn't enjoy the book, I'm going to say bad book, but if they didn't enjoy it, they don't care if the little questions get answered or not. So they won't feel compelled to go to the next one. But if they really enjoyed it, that little bit of but what about could compel them to go to the next one. So for this book, um, 
you know, maybe there's a, one of the evil werewolves is still lingering around. And what was it you said a minute ago? I said I like. Oh, oh the police. The police. The police. Yes. Yeah. Maybe, maybe in, in, in like a little epilogue or something, you find out that one of the cops takes a call from the, and, and the kit here says werewolves for revenge on her. Well, maybe you show that by having one of the detectives that was investigating the mom or something, take a call from a, a known werewolf saying, all right, we need to do something about this L chick. She got on my nerves. You see what I'm saying? We're going to have so to just, wait to the next epochs because of this chick. Right. You did, exactly. You're not handling your district. <laughs> Exactly. You know, so you see that there's like a, maybe these werewolves have a secret network, you know, maybe the cop's not even a werewolf. Maybe he's just a familiar who's doing their bidding with the promise of being turned one day. It's on the books you know. for now. Yeah. So drop hint to next story. All right. That's it. That's my brainstorming process. At this point, I would go back and I would start making notes for, okay, who's Lieutenant Moon? What's mom's story? I want to know how she's tied to the bad guys before I start writing it. Yeah, you know, definitely. so this is when you let yourself get in the weeds a little bit more. Like right now I have basically one or two sentences per point. Yeah. So if I go back and do it, I might, I might have one or two paragraphs per point to really flesh it out more. But the idea in a brainstorming session for me is to just get down a, a roadmap from once upon a time to the end. You know, just the little the waypoints you want to hit that, you know, you want to hit from beginning to end. And then you can go back and flesh them out and then you can just sit down and write the book and you've got it mapped out as you need to go. And that's how I do it, folks. And also, I, I mean, thank you, Chuck, for, for taking us through this, because it's so easily. I mean, you can see just right out from the get go gate. Lord and I both were just like, Wee! and Chuck said, no, <laughs> yep, yep. no. Stop it. I'm just trying to get this. What I need a person, ladies. Just give me a person. And we're already just like yeah. off here. Totally. So it's like just so easily you can get caught up in the weeds. But if you just, like he was saying, take that focus. scope and yeah. just know that once you get through that, that first pass, you know, that's where you can then like really start exploring all those fun ideas. Like, you know, what's Lieutenant Moon's, you know, purpose being in the school? What sort of, what sort of things does she do in the school? Does she have um, a, a rival? You know, what's that walk like when she's coming back home? Um, what are these, you know, like someone had mentioned one of the cops really gives her the creeps. Like, how does that going to play into it? You know, all those extra other ideas where you start applying paint you know that's you know what we're papa chuck saying that's the second pass all we're doing is sketching yeah right the now. best way i've ever heard it put is that what we did right here is build the skeleton mm. and then when you go back you start putting flesh on the monster okay and making it putting the muscles on making it bigger and, and oh. thicker and, and eventually you get to the whole book Yep. And sometimes, you know, that leg doesn't look right. So you scrap that leg and oh, you put on a new one. That is but an you excellent know point. Beginning to end. So you yeah. can more easily swap legs out. Yes. This is utterly changeable. This is in no way written in stone, but it is a starting point. Right. So if you get halfway through and realize, oh, okay, well, that midpoint isn't really going to make sense, you just go back, refocus. And it'll make, but you've got, the point is you have something to work from. You're not starting mm -hmm. at zero. And that's where most people get trapped. Even if they're excited and they write the first half of something and they get to that marshy middle and they have nothing to, to refer back to, that's where I've found a lot of new writers, a lot of young writers really get, get, get stuck is because they just, they don't, they need that seed to work from and they haven't provided themselves that. So for me, this is the best way to have the roadmap. So again, my way, not saying it's for everybody, but I hope it helped out some folks. Well, it definitely is giving me ideas to help focus before I get too weedy. Yeah, thank you. And it makes me feel kind of optimistic, like I can do this. This Absolutely. is manageable. Absolutely. If you have the smallest amount of imagination and desire to write a book, you can do it. 
You just, mm -hmm. you, but you have to focus. You can't get caught up in the fun parts. You got to break it down into the work. You know, that's right. the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And I also want to mention, um, cause we're, we're going to do an end of the show sponsor. <laughs> I just want to really <laughs> yeah. Quickly, yeah, we kind of blew we through were, that, didn't we? <laughs> no, you're good. This is what we were going to point out. So like after you get through that outline during, while you're doing the outline, if you're, if you're like, can do that. Um, I've only like read through like chapter one. Um, of writing of, the breakout novel yeah. workbook by Donald Moss. Thank you. I have read that book. I've never used the workbook, but that that is a, a very good, uh, very good writer book for but plotting just for, and that kind of thing. Yeah, just for some more, like if you're especially if you're you're one of those writers that they, you're just like I just need a little bit more, like idea of 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 how to create and craft my process because everyone's process is going to be a little bit different. Maybe you take out of this focusing on the genre subgenre that person place thing and then you just pants the crap at it from there if that's what you want to do go for it i mean you know, that's what works for you oh there's an upteen unlimited amount of ways to write a book so go forth find your genres find your characters and really engage the reader in your worlds all right thank you so much baba chuck for happy coming to be on here girls happy to be here Thank you, audience. Y'all were fantastic. Kit, Leo Vaccaro, DFM Games, hello. I saw you. We didn't get mm -hmm. to your thing text messages on mom's phone. They don't know she's dead. That could be a secondary, like, ooh, that's fun. That could be the last oh, line of the novel. Is, yeah. yeah I like that fun. one. I wanted to point I that like out. That. I remembered. Absolutely. That's a also good one. Patricia Gilliam. Uh, let's see who else we got. Corey. Gilliam, and I know we had some other people up in here, uh, Bard of Today. Thank you all for coming on, joining us on this live plot idea to ending. We actually did it. I wasn't sure if we could get from beginning <laughs> to end, and we did, and that's fantastic, and I love it, and I need to go apply it to my own ideas percolating in my head that I've been avoiding getting on paper. All right, so no more avoidance, butt in the chair, do all the writing for Lauren Moore, Papa Chuck. Thank you for joining us on your writer's journey. Be sure to check us out next week. Where we're going to talk about more reading, writing, and everything in between right here on Keystroke Mediums, The Writer's Journey.